Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for 2023. <laughs> welcome, welcome, and welcome to all of you from all around the world. My name is Brian Callanan, and I'm a 46-year-old adult living with CF in Miami, Florida, and one of the BreatheCon co-chairs. This year's theme focuses on the rhetorical question, how do you CF? It is an open question that invites inclusion and welcoming to every way that people with CF live successfully, such as how do you view the world with CF? How do you approach challenges? Does CF broaden or limit your perspectives? Do you focus on strengths or on weaknesses? How do you stand up in the face of adversity? Do you view CF as a limitation or as a driving force? This year's swag contest winner, Kelly Tallarico, illustrates this so beautifully in how CF is baked into who she is and to each of us and has all different beauties, textures, and elements of challenge in the cookies that reflect some clear lungs, some congested lungs, and a theme of color celebrating the foundation that has done such groundbreaking work in literally changing the landscape of this disease for so many and in the near future for those that still await revolutionary treatments. I hope you will take the opportunity here today to relate to the experience of others who share your struggles and your successes. Before I introduce tonight's keynote speaker, I want to go over a few items related to technology and how we can all interact. You'll notice both the event-wide chat and the stage chat. The stage chat is where you can interact with other participants watching the keynote, and the event-wide chat is available for all who are in attendance tonight. This keynote is being recorded and will be available for all registra registrants after the event. In the commitment to create a safe space where everyone feels welcomed and supported, we encourage you to add your pronouns to your last name. You can do this by clicking the drop down menu arrow on the top right of your screen and selecting edit profile. Adding pronouns allows us to easily address community members with their preferred pronouns and ensure all feel welcomed and supported. Please remember to adhere to the community guidelines each participant agreed to while registering for BreatheCon and be kind, open minded and respectful of everyone's opinions and life experiences. Keep all breakout and chat discussions confidential. Use your real identity. Do not use malicious or offensive speech. And finally, do not ask for or give medical advice. If you have any technology problems during the session, please visit the help desk. Now, I have the honor to introduce keynote speaker, Lisa Bentley. Lisa is a true hero who I am proud to know with admiration and call a friend. As an 11 time Ironman champion, her story of transformation realizes the power of her CF as a motivational speaker and author. I'm so happy to present to you the e opening keynote speaker for the 2023 BreatheCon event and sharing how Lisa does CF. Please Hi there, I am so pleased to get to meet everybody today. I wish I could see everyone and um, just really interact with you, but it's fantastic that we get to see each other virtually and that we get to come together tonight to share and to grow and to learn and to re-energize for 2023. In sport, we say that great players make good players great. Great players make good players great. Well, clearly you're already great human beings. You're here. But my goal is to fire up the greatness in each of you so that you can continue to get out of your comfort zone, exceed expectations, live without limits, and then inspire others to do the same. I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about one of the greatest times in your life. Put yourself in that memory. For me, it was 2006. 
I was at the top of my sport. I was winning races. I had finally cracked the podium at the Ironman World Championships. I had great sponsorship relationships. I was beginning to build my post-racing career, doing speaking and television commentary and coaching. I was newly married. I had great friendships. My mom and dad were healthy and thriving. I was on top of the world. Now I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about one of the most difficult times in your life. Put yourself in that memory. For me, it was just three years later, 2009. My lung health was deteriorating. I'd been on and off antibiotics for much of the summer. Somehow I squeaked out a win at Ironman Philippines only to find myself coughing up blood just two days later. It, that then led to a gradual decline in my lung capacity to just 55%, which is essentially one lung, forcing me to retire from a career that I absolutely loved. This photo was taken from the finish line at Ironman 70.3 Muskoka, which would be my last race. My mom was there. My mom rarely came to races, but moms know, don't they, when they're, you're needed. I remember going for runs, just an easy jog and struggling to breathe. Something that had been so easy for me was now so difficult. And I thought, is that what it's like to be a scholar and then not be able to read or write or communicate? I was losing who I was. And even motherhood was off the table since my lung health couldn't support a pregnancy. I was so sad, but I didn't want to be sad. I wanted to be happy. And I knew I had the strategies to turn this around. I'd use them in all of my racing and all of my training. I knew that adversity could lead to greatness. I knew that attitude was more important than fact. It is not our conditions that define us. It's our decisions about those conditions. And so I ran. I ran without comparison to who I used to be. I ran because that's what we do. That's what you and I do. We find a way where there is no way. This photo was taken two days before I was admitted into the hospital to start five weeks of IV antibiotics. And I'm happy because I chose to be happy. Our arenas change over time, but the strategies for successful living are no different. If you're trying to win a race, win in business or win in life. We have to focus on our progress, our process, rather than perfection. There's only one way to be perfect, but there's thousands of ways to be great. So let's be great. I want to take you into my office. And you may think this looks different from your office, but I would guess that we have more in common than you think. This is the Ironman World Championships, and I'm in there. I've literally jumped into that ocean of chaos and confusion, risking everything, vulnerable to expectation and pressure, and yet I'm completely in control, confident that my mind and body will get me where I need to go in spite of the 3,000 arms and legs in my way. Why? Because I've practiced this. I visualize this, I've prepared for it, and now I finally get to do it. That is the calmest I've felt all day. I have stood on hundreds of start lines all over the world with the best athletes in the world. My sport is triathlon, swim, bike, run. And some races are as short as an hour and others are longer than eight hours. And my favorite is the longest and the hardest of them all, the Ironman. Swim 2.4 miles, bike 112 miles, and then go run a marathon 26.2 miles. In my career, I raced 33 Ironmans and I won 11 of them. And really any of the women that I race against could win the race. They all train hard, they all have coaches, they take care of nutrition, and yet some women will never win a single race. So what sets us apart? When I was in high school, my track coach told me that I had no talent. So can you become a champion on hard work, 
grit, and determination alone? A champion, whether it be in business, in sport, in life, has an inner fire, a drive to turn a no into a yes and to find a way where there is no way. That's all of you. That's all of us. For me, my mind is the strongest part of my body. My mind fuels me when my muscles fail and my mind can turn adversity into success. But it really all starts with one simple statement. Finish what you start and do it with heart. Heart is truly the essence of all peak performance. In fact, I'd say that to be the best, you have to be both competitive and compassionate. Of course, you've got to be competitive. You've got to want to get after it. You have to focus. You have to prepare. You actually have to do the work to get the job done. You have to be competitive. But you also have to be compassionate to yourself, to others, and to your craft. You must wholeheartedly love what you're doing, love your colleagues, or in my case, my competitors, and love yourself in order to be the best. That's called wholeheartedness, and it's an attitude. It can be learned. When you lead with your heart, barriers become opportunities and adversity becomes success. You all know that. You've been doing it all of your life. I want to share with you some strategies and tactics that I learned and developed through racing, which are completely applicable to our everyday life, and tell you a few stories along the way. Anyone can do good when the going is good. A true champion finds success in adversity. You all know the feeling. You're riding a bike. you got a slight downhill, a tailwind. You feel like you're the best cyclist in the world. You're ready to join the Tour de France. It feels so easy. Or the days where you catch all the green lights, where your to-do list just gets keeps getting ticked off, where your kids are happy, there's no struggles. Those days where everyone returns your phone calls, those are the easy days. Anyone can do good when the going is good. But it's the tough days. It's the days where there feels like there's roadblock after roadblock and hurdle and obstacles. And we don't wish for those days. But when they happen, they usually bring us the most fulfillment at the end of them. Anyone can do good when the going is good. A true champion finds success in adversity. This photo was taken at the Ironman World Championships one mile from the finish line. I look gritty and I look like a warrior there. But let me take you back six miles. Let me go back even a little bit further. Hawaii Ironman World Championships, the best in the world are racing. I had a great swim. I got out where I needed to be, not in the lead, about eight minutes down, but I'm in the race. Out onto the bike, 112 miles, about five hours of riding. I made up some time on some people, had a great competitive ride. I got off the bike in 15th place which for me was fantastic. I was a runner, marathoner. So now I'm about to hit my strength. And I started the run. I felt fantastic. Of course, anyone can feel good in the beginning. And by halfway in the marathon, by 13 miles, I had moved from 15th place to sixth place. I was in the hunt. I had passed the Ironman world champion, the defending champion. I had passed the Olympic gold medalist. I was in sixth place and feeling fantastic. As the race continues on, at at around 16 miles into the marathon, there's this little detour off the course called the Energy Lab. You go two miles into the Energy Lab, then two miles out, and then back in to the finish line, which is about six miles away. And I'll never forget it, running into the Energy Lab, slightly downhill and a little breeze coming off of the ocean, which made it feel beautiful. It's 90 degrees out, a little breeze, a little downhill. I felt invincible. And I think to myself, I'm going to win this race. I feel fantastic. I'm writing my victory speech. I'm buying my husband the golf membership. I feel amazing. I run the two miles into the energy lab and I turn around. And now that little breeze has become a tailwind and it's hot. It is so hot. And that slight downhill now It's an uphill and it feels like Mount Everest. I'm absolutely exhausted. Now I'm in third place. And let me tell you the scenario. First place is about six or seven minutes up the road. 
very doable, very catchable. Second place is literally right here. That's second place. I'm in third place right here. Fourth place is right here. We are just stacked together. Second, third, and fourth. I'm in third place. I've been having the race of my life. I am the runner. But I was so tired and it was so hard. And I wanted to quit. I wanted to escape. And I started rationalizing, dropping out. I started telling myself these falsities. Lisa, don't worry. You've had a great race for eight hours. You can come back next year and race the last 45 minutes. You've had a good day. You should be proud of yourself. It's okay to quit right now. These are the thoughts going in my mind. I was weak. I was tired. I was out of energy. And as we came out of the energy lab, I'm still in third place. Second is here. Fourth is here. There was a port and I stopped and I pulled off the course and I went into the port And honestly, if someone had delivered me the New York Times, I would never have left. I was so happy to be off the course. I was out of the risk. I was so scared. I was out of energy. I wanted to remove myself from the risk. I wanted to quit. And who wouldn't? I mean, really, who wants to run the last six miles in 90 degrees of heat after racing for eight hours? Nobody. Who wants to get up at 4.30 in the morning? Nobody. Who wants to go for a run, a swim, a bike? Nobody. But it's the stuff you don't want to do that you have to do. It's getting out of your comfort zone that is the key. All the good stuff happens on the other side of the comfort zone. If there's something you don't want to do, chances are you should be doing it. When I got out of that portal, I knew what I needed to do. I needed calories. I needed Coca-Cola. I needed sugar. I needed to get my brain screwed back on again. And I said to myself, Lisa, 45 minutes of hard work versus 45 days of regret, because that's what it would have been. And so I got some Coca-Cola and I got back to running. Thankfully, the Olympic gold medalist and the world champion didn't pass me. I was in fourth place. Second and third kept on going. I was now in fourth place, and I was running as hard as I could to get back into the game. This photo is from one mile to the finish line. I'm back in third place and still believing that I could possibly win the race or get in second. I finished third place that day at the Ironman World Championships, which was my best finish but it would have been so easy to quit. Anyone can do good when the going is good. A true champion finds success in adversity. We might have to dig for it. We might have to get out of our comfort zone. We won't want to do it, but it's what you don't want to do that you have to do, and that will make you a champion. Attitude is more important than fact. Whatever fact is facing you is not nearly as important as your attitude. I mean, the fact is everyone here tonight has cystic fibrosis. That's a fact. But what's your attitude? I hope your attitude is that you're going to be the best person on this planet with cystic fibrosis, that you're going to be the best teacher with cystic fibrosis, the best parent with cystic fibrosis, the best student, business person, CEO, whatever it happens to be, you'll be the best at that with CF attitude is more important than fact. It is not our conditions that define us. It's our decisions about those conditions. A funny story about my puppy Fenway when she was a puppy. She was so naughty. If I wanted to go right, she wanted to go left. We take off our shoes. She'd run around the house with our shoes. I was trying to train this puppy to be a great dog and it was so frustrating for me and it was taking the joy out of her. And I remember that all changed with one simple change in attitude. I said to myself, Lisa, Fenway's not a bad dog. She just makes bad decisions. And from then on, I just laughed and loved her to pieces. Attitude is more important than fact. I was racing Ironman Australia. And I was going there as the four-time defending champion. And there was so much pressure. It was 2006. Everyone just expected that I was going to win the race. There was so much pressure. And I just could not look at pressure as a bad thing. The reality was there was pressure because I had been successful, because I had won races. 
And so to wish for no pressure was really to wish for no success, which didn't make sense. We worked so hard for it. And so I reframed pressure. Pressure was really just good wishes, people wishing me well. And so on race day, I took all those good wishes and I got myself ready to race. And I hadn't even started the race yet. I'm just running towards the ocean to get to jump in for the race. And I bumped up against a fence. I ripped my race suit and then I stepped on a nail. I stopped in my tracks. I pulled out this nail. I looked at my race suit, thought that'll be fine. Looked at this nail and said, I'm not giving control up to this. I've worked trained too hard. There is nothing I would rather do than race right now. And I continued on and jumped in the ocean. There's 3000 competitors. One cannon blast starts this race. I've done it hundreds of times before. The cannon went off. Everyone starts swimming. And I'm lined up there with my competitors, the people that I have to mark. I want to stay with them as long as possible. The gun goes off. We all start swimming. There's arms and legs everywhere. And within the first five minutes, I get elbowed in the face. I get a black eye, which I didn't know till I got to the finish line. But my goggles come off. I still have 45 minutes of swimming left. I have to get these goggles back on. It's salt water. So I stop and I fumble and I'm trying to put these goggles back on. My competitors, they keep on swimming. No one's waiting for me. I get my goggles back on and I get back to swimming. And you may think, were you frustrated? Didn't you want to quit? And of course, those things go through your head. But I got my head back in the game and I started swimming. But, you know, of course, the internal dialogue was, oh, my goodness, the com your competitors are off the front. You, you have no chance. And I knew I needed to change that around. The fact was, yes, I've lost my goggles. I've lost time. But my attitude was that I was going to find a way. You see, I was a, called an Ironman champion. That was my title, Ironman champion. And I thought to myself in those moments after the goggle incident, I thought, well, what's a champion? It's a great thing to call you. But if you're really a champion, that means you don't quit. If you're really a champion, it means you problem solve. If you're really a champion, you find a way to get the job done. And so in those moments, I thought to myself, you know, today's the day where you're really going to have to prove it, Lisa, clearly. You've already ripped your suit, stepped on a nail, and lost your goggles. So today's the day you're being challenged. You're being asked to prove that you actually deserve this title. And I went a step further. I said, you know, three obstacles already, three curveballs. This is going to be my obstacle race. Today's the day where every obstacle I'm going to turn into opportunity. I'm going to play with it. Throw it at me. What else are you going to throw at me? So I decided that this would be the day where I was going to prove I was champion, number one, not necessarily win, might not win, but I'm going to prove that I deserve that title by measure of not quitting, and by getting to that finish line. And I'm also going to take every obstacle, every curveball and turn it into success. So now when I was swimming, I had purpose. I had a theme. I had a mission. And now I was excited. So I got through that swim, lost some time, got onto my bike. Nutrition is super important in an Ironman. You're riding your bike for five hours. You've got to fuel it. You need electrolyte drink, you need calories. And I used to try to carry as much with me as I possibly could so that I didn't lend myself to having GI distress by relying on the aid stations. And there were lots of aid stations, but if you take the wrong concoction, your race could be over because you might be throwing up. So I would carry as much as possible with me on the bike, which is literally impossible. You can't carry seven bottles of electrolyte drink. So instead, I'd create this super duper special water bottle that had a concentrated amount. And so I'm riding along and I'm aggressive and I'm excited and I, this is the day I'm going to prove I'm a champion. And I hit a bump and I lose my super duper special water bottle. My nutrition's gone. I wasn't frustrated because today was the day that I was going to turn every obstacle into opportunity. And I thought to myself, no problem, Lisa. The special needs A station's coming up. That's halfway through. And you, you were able to put your own special bag of goodies there. And I had some electrolyte drink in there. So I got ready to get to halfway through the bike ride. And I get there and I'm calling out my number so I can get my special needs bag. And they don't get it for me. The volunteers miss me. So I go through that special needs area without my nutrition. No problem. 
today's the day that I will take every obstacle and turn it into opportunity. It's an opportunity for me to prove that I can be a champion no matter what. And so I thought, no problem. I'll get water from the aid stations. I'll take extra power bars and power gels, the sugar for my fuel, and I'll take salt pills as my electrolyte. So I'm doing a little chemistry. Remember, I'm, I'm riding as hard as I can for 112 miles, but I'm also concocting my nutrition plan. Anyone can do good when the going is good. A champion finds a way where there is no way. I got onto the run and it was a bit more challenging than normal, but I kept putting one foot in front of the other, telling myself today is the day you may not win, but you are not going to quit. You are going to problem solve. You are going to prove that you are really a champion. And on that day when so many things went wrong, I was able to win my fifth Ironman Australia. Your attitude is more important than fact, whatever fact is facing you. Nail in the foot, torn suit, black eye, goggles knocked off, lost time, lost my nutrition, whatever the facts are. My attitude was that I was not going to quit, that I would turn those obstacles into opportunity. I mean, if we can get kids to eat pizza crusts made out of cauliflower, and eat broccoli smothered in cheese, certainly we can do mental acrobatics so that we can be happy day to day. Attitude is more important than fact. Only you can be you as efficiently as you can be you. We all do it. We wish to be somebody else. We wish we were as successful as that person. We wish we were as attractive as that person. We wish we didn't have CF. Wish, wish, wish. But the reality is we are best at being ourselves. If there's something you don't like about yourself, then change it. Otherwise, accept who you are. Love yourself. And while we will never be perfect, let's be perfect at being our best selves. And how do you do that? How do you become your own biggest fan? You count your blessings. Literally. Before every single race, I would sit down and I would write a list of my assets. I would write everything that I had going for me. Because when I'm in the heat of the battle, when I'm in the race and it's struggle and I'm 20 minutes back, it's easy to get discouraged. So I'd pull out my asset list and I'd remind myself that I had a lot more going for me than I may think at that time. And some of the things I would put on my asset list that I'm loved, that I'm educated, that I have two great dogs, a husband, that I'm empathetic, that I can listen to people, that I have a dream team, I'm surrounded by great people, that I'm a problem solver, that I never, ever, ever quit. And certainly my assets would include some race-related ones, but a lot of them were just about me. And they were things that were never going to change no matter what. And when you can feed yourself your assets, you'll realize that you're less defeated than you think. It is a massive part of being your own biggest fan and bringing the most joy to yourself. And when we can use all those tactics, we get to our finish lines. This is from the finish line at that Ironman World Championships. After I had the little port loo moment and wanted to quit, I crossed the finish line in third place, which was my best finish at the World Championships. But what was even better about that third place finish was that my teammate Desiree came in second. Now, of course, I wanted to beat her. I'm a competitor, but we were on the same team. And five weeks prior to race day, we had a team training camp in Hawaii and she was a rookie. And I shared all of my knowledge, all of my pacing, nutrition, everything I learned from racing at the Hawaii Ironman for the 10 years prior. And then she went and took all that knowledge and beat all of us. We have to be the best people we can be, but we also have to inspire others. We have to share our greatness with others and help them be great people too. Teamwork is key. Encourage others, inspire others, lead with your heart. And this is a very different picture, one that many of you are likely familiar with. I have cystic fibrosis, just like you. And this photo was taken from 2010. 
when my lung function dropped to 55%. And I started five weeks of IV antibiotics. And you might look at this photo and feel a bit sad, a bit thinking about yourself, thinking how terrible this disease is. But I look at this photo and I see a gift. I see a blessing. And that is a bold statement coming from a professional athlete whose lungs are her engine. But I truly believe that I would never have won 11 Ironmans. I would never have competed in 33 Ironmans if I didn't have cystic fibrosis. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that CF was my superpower. Now, I didn't always feel that way. When I first started racing triathlon, I hated that I had CF. I hid it from everyone. I never told anybody. I didn't tell the media. I didn't tell my coach. I didn't tell my competitors. If I got sick, I took antibiotics and just did the best that I could. I didn't want to have a built-in excuse for a poor performance. And I certainly didn't want to have this asterisk after my name. Lisa Bentley, she's a pretty good athlete. She has cystic fibrosis. No, I wanted to earn my accolades first and foremost as an athlete. I started the sport doing what's called the standard distance or Olympic distance, which is a 1.5 kilometer swim, 40 kilometer bike ride, followed by a 10K run. And I loved it. And I was on the national team. I went to the Pan American Games. But I really loved the idea of Ironman, training and racing all day long. And so in 1997, I did my first Ironman. And I wanted to win one so badly. It took me three years, but finally in the year 2000, I won Ironman New Zealand. And there was no chest infection. There was no mention of cystic fibrosis. And there were no asterisks. I was an Ironman champion through and through. But I'm a competitor. So of course, I wanted to do it again. So I kept training and racing. And I went back to Ironman New Zealand in 2001. And I won it again. And I'll never forget crossing that finish line. I should have been so happy. But instead, it felt kind of empty. And I couldn't figure out why. It's hard work to win in Ironman. But it felt hollow. And I, and I couldn't figure out why. And I didn't talk to my coach or look at my watch. Instead, I looked inside my heart. I love these words. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can change. And the wisdom to know the difference. I had never accepted the fact that I had cystic fibrosis. I hid it from everyone. I didn't want anyone to know. But it took the hollowness of that second Ironman win for me to realize that I needed to have the courage to accept who I was and to change my attitude. There was a reason why I was a triathlete and there was a reason I had CF. It was to bring hope to families with CF. There had to be a reason, there had to be a purpose. And it really made sense to me when my mother-in-law was diagnosed with liver cancer. She was 68 years old and the prognosis was not good. But we found this other woman who was 30 years old and she had a similar cancer, a similar surgery, similar chemo, and she lived. And that was hope. It didn't matter that she was half my mother-in-law's age. She had the cancer the surgery, the chemo, she lived, and that was hope. Now, I want you to take a moment and I want you to picture yourself. You've just had a tiny baby. And the doctor comes in and tells you that your tiny baby has cystic fibrosis. You just want to bury your head in your hands. But then the doctor tells you that there's this woman and she has cystic fibrosis and she does triathlons all over the world and she's healthy. And all of a sudden you can lift your head out of your hands and your eyes fill with hope. I could be that hope. And it took the hollowness of that second Ironman win for me to realize it. 
And so now every time I swam and biked and ran, of course I wanted to win a race. I was a competitor. But more than that, I just wanted to keep moving forward because every single time I raced, I could potentially bring hope to families with CF. And that fueled me. And this really came to fruition when I met this incredible woman named Tracy Richardson. Tracy lived in New Zealand and she had two kids, Cameron and McKenna, with very severe CF. I was racing at Ironman New Zealand and we connected and we met. Tracy felt helpless as a mother of two kids with very severe CF. There was nothing she could do to make them well. But after we met, she saw the power of exercise the power of exercise to strengthen the lungs, to get rid of the mucus, to avoid some chest infections, and of course, the self-esteem and empowerment that comes from doing sport. But the challenge is, is that after all that money is spent on antibiotics and hospitalizations and therapies, there's very little money left to put your child into sport. So she created the Breath for CF Foundation to raise money so that kids with CF would have access to sport. And she decided that she was going to raise Ironman New Zealand to raise awareness and raise funds. She wasn't a triathlete, she was a mother, but she did it. She did Ironman New Zealand the very next year. And it was a tremendous success. It was so successful, in fact, that the Ironman Corporation, they saw what she did and they invited her to race the Ironman World Championships. They would highlight the Breath for CF Foundation and they would focus on two stories. Tracy, the incredible mother racing for her kids and myself, professional athlete with CF who was trying to actually win the race. I was so excited at the prospect. Can you imagine? <laughs> If I could win the Ironman World Championships, what a dream to do it on a year where CF was being highlighted. People would see that CF doesn't have to be a death sentence. And that fueled me. I trained so hard and I was so fit and so ready to race. On Monday morning before the race day, I woke up with a terrible chest infection. You know what I'm talking about. My lungs were clogged, I couldn't breathe, I was coughing like crazy. I knew there was no way that I could race the best women in the world with lungs that weren't working properly. I started to feel pretty sorry for myself. I took some antibiotics, I did some therapies, you all know the drill, but I was pretty sad. A few days later on Wednesday, we were having a press conference to highlight the Breath for CF Foundation. This photo was taken from that press conference and I'll never forget it. I walked into the room and Tracy was sitting on the stage and our eyes locked and my eyes filled with tears. And I thought to myself, shame on you, Lisa Bentley, shame on you, you're upset because you might not win the Ironman World Championships because you have a chest infection, which is temporary. Meanwhile, Tracy's kids are likely to need lung transplants before they turn 30. Shame on you. And in that moment, my attitude changed. I was so lucky. <laughs> I was so lucky, I got to race at the World Championships. I was so lucky, I got to race the best women in the world at the most important race in my sport. And I made a promise to myself in that moment that I was going to be the best person on that start line with a chest infection and with cystic fibrosis. I was gonna race for all those kids everywhere who would give anything to feel the burning pain in my legs. It is not our conditions that define us. It is our decisions about those conditions. I would do the best that I could with my deck of cards, embrace who I was. Race day was magical. 
even though I raced 140.6 miles in the heat, the humidity, the wind, and the pressure cooker that is a world championships, I don't remember feeling tired or hot. I don't remember coughing once. With the power of the heart and the mind, and by fully embracing who I was, all of myself, I was able to elevate my training, my talent, my lung health to a level that I would never have thought possible. And on that day, I was able to finish fourth place at the Ironman World Championships on a day where, you know, it would have been very easy to stay in bed. That is the power of the mind and the heart and your attitude. Attitude is more important than fact. But more importantly, Tracy finished the race as well. And she was able to raise over $800,000 for the Breath for CF Foundation. That is hope. And this photo is one year later. Same race, Ironman World Championships. I should be competing, but I'm crying. I should be running, but I'm walking. I was sick again. And I used all my strategies and tactics. I had a, the best attitude I could possibly have, but I wasn't able to get it done. Wasn't able to uncover the same magic. And that's okay. There's no regrets. There's no failure. We must try. We must do the best that we can with our deck of cards. We must get in the arena. There is no failure if we try. I love the quote from Theodore Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts. It is not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by blood and sweat and tears, who strives valiantly, who at best at the end knows the triumph of high achievement and who at worst, if he fails, at least he fails by daring greatly. We must get in the arena, get out of our comfort zone, and do the best we can with our deck of cards. Our arenas, they change over time. My arena has definitely changed. Since retiring from professional sport, I still exercise every day, but I do it for my health and my wellness rather than for trophies and accolades but I did have one thing left on my athletic bucket list. I always wanted to run the Boston Marathon. Ironically, I had raced 33 Ironmans and therefore 33 marathons, but I'd never actually just run a marathon without biking and swimming first. And I secretly wanted to know how fast I could go if there was no swim and bike. Well, I finally got my wish. In 2011, two years after I retired, I got invited to race the Boston Marathon. I was so excited, but I was also scared. In the two years since retiring, the longest I had run was nine miles. The race was in six weeks and the marathon's 26.2 miles. There was no way I could be prepared in time. And while my lung health had improved, it had bounced from 55% to 72%, I still didn't really have a full tank of gas. But I think the thing holding me back the most came from my own head. What would people think? They were used to fast, Lisa. They were used to seeing me run through the field, winning races. And I wasn't that person anymore. Do you ever get held back wondering what other people might think? Does it ever hold you back from doing something you really want to do? I needed to read a page from my own book. I knew that I needed to love who I was now, to fully embrace who I was now, to not be afraid of my resume or expectation, but to use it, use my experience to my advantage. I needed to feel the joy and the privilege of racing with 35,000 other runners, all with their own story, but united by one start line and one finish line. My victory would come from getting in the arena and doing the best that I could right now. And so I ran. 
and my experience and my competitive juices fired me up and I ran way faster than I thought I could or that I should. But boy, that last six miles was so painful, cramping and shuffling. It was so, so difficult. I got to the finish line though. My husband took this photo as I was stumbling and shuffling my way to him. He was laughing because he had never seen me in so much discomfort after racing. He had seen all those Ironmans, but I was laughing right along with him because I was fulfilled. I didn't win the race. I didn't even win my age group, but I totally won because I got into the arena and I did my best. That's all that we can ever do. There's only one way to be perfect, but there's thousands of ways to be great. So let's be great. We all have a story. I look forward to hearing some of your stories. And here's mine in highlights. When I was in grade school, my family doctor told me to be less smart in school to avoid intimidating the boys. Apparently, smart girls are less attractive. My high school track coach told me that I had no talent. My sports doctor said that I would never be a runner with my flat feet. Oh, yes. And like you, I have cystic fibrosis. So statistically speaking, I shouldn't even be alive right now. But I ignored everyone. I took my brains, my lack of talent, my flat feet, and my cystic fibrosis to the University of Waterloo. I ran track and cross country. I graduated from math and computer science. I became a teacher. I became a professional athlete. I won 11 Ironmans. I got married. I wrote a book. And now I'm speaking to you. Was I afraid? Absolutely. I was afraid at 7 p.m. before I started to speak to you. But I was also brave. And courage trumps fear every single time. Find your courage. And courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is a little tiny voice that says, let's try again tomorrow. So let's all go to our own personal start lines, wherever they are, to be humble yet confident leaders, to accept who we are and yet be wise and courageous enough to pivot and adapt and rise to every opportunity and then inspire others to do the same. Adversity can lead to greatness. Be your own biggest fan. Fire up your courage in your heart and reignite the compassion in your heart for yourself and for others. When you lead with your heart, everything becomes possible. Be driven by what's inside and finish what you start and do all things with heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing your story. I wish I could just give you a hug right in this moment. Lisa, you brought so much brightness, inspiration, and perspective to how CF is such an integral part of who we are. You reminded me of a piece of advice from my father that with every difficulty, you have the choice of becoming bitter or better. Having an attitude of gratitude, and I just love your choice of being your best to those who are aspiring to reach their own acclamations with no limits. <laughs> to live with CF, a tenacity that can climb the highest mountains and leave your adversities in the rear view mirror. Thank you all for your attention and for your engagement. And before we go, please take some time filling out the satisfaction questionnaire under the poll tab on the right hand side of your screen. We'd love to know how you felt about today's conversation. We hope you join us for the affinity groups beginning in five minutes in the sessions tab to chat and socialize with others who share common interests, experiences, or identities. Thank you all again for participating in BreatheCon 2023, and we look forward to the next couple of days of fun information and sharing.